Not long ago, I mean, it's always my habit when I drive to and from work to have the radio on. I may be listening to a talk show. I may be listening to music. Uh, there's a we have a marvelous uh, uh, sacred music station in Tyler that has a, a, a strata of music that I particularly enjoy and I find soothing. I especially like it on Friday night driving home from work. But one day, a couple of weeks or several days ago, but for some reason, I I was aggravated, annoyed, uh, ag agitated, and uh, I decided I did not need any more noise in the car. So I shut the radio off, and uh, as I was driving home from work. And I forgot the next morning to turn it back on, and actually for several days I did not turn the radio on. And I made a discovery during that time. And it was a, it's a strange discovery. It's one I want to share with you, lest, just in case it has some relevance to you. I found that I had more good ideas in those days driving my car to and from work than I had at any other time during the day, including the time that I was sitting down in front of my computer, supposed to be doing creative work in terms of writing letters or writing articles or doing biblical research or whatever it was. And I thought this was interesting, you know. Why is it that I can sit down in a chair in my office and one set of things happen? I can sit behind the wheel of my car and I can start off toward home and another thing entirely different happens between my ears, as it were, and I was puzzled by this. And I've given it some thought and I've come to some conclusions. After 50 years of driving a car, which is pretty close now to how long I've been driving, I, it is driving is very, it's really quite automatic. And I don't think it's altogether unsafe. Maybe it's not as safe as it would be if I was fully concentrating on it. But I can drive, you know, in, in moderate traffic conditions and have absolutely no idea whether or not the last light I passed through was red or green. <laughs> yes, isn't it? I have confidence, though, that it was green. Because I have noticed that I do stop at a lot of red lights. And I do that without thinking a great deal about stopping at the red lights. And I expect a lot of you people are the same way. Uh, you learn the skills and, 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 and you're, you're able to do it on autopilot. It's not that you are not thinking about it. It's a compartmentalization thing. There's a part of your mind that takes over the driving problems, that takes the input and then gives the output to the steering wheel and to the brakes and the mechanism that's there. And we can do a lot of different things while we drive our cars because it does not make great demands on us as far as our mental faculties are concerned. Now, as I say, I thought that was interesting. I had not realized, as a matter of fact, until that happened, how little time I was giving in my life in more recent months to simple thinking about my job, about my life, about my God, about my work, about what's on your mind, what your needs are that I was being, uh, as it were, blown around by circumstances and the, the times and the places that I was and by the needs that were being brought upon me day in and day out about the work and how that at this time of this year I'm, I'm do, trying to do three radio programs a week to get uh, um, reach 200 before the Feast of Tabernacles. And so I have that very much on my mind as well as the necessity of getting letters out. So I'm very busy, you know, with, with a lot of pressures. And I did not realize that I had begun to allow something to happen that, uh, that I really didn't want to happen. And it was that little inadvertent thing in the car that made me realize that there were all kinds of things going on in my subconscious mind that had been trying for a long time to get out, and I was not giving them the time to get out. Years ago, uh, when I was in another organization, they uh, brought in a management specialist to do classes for those of us who were in executive level of the work. And uh, he had us put a time log on ourselves one week. Every 10 minutes of the day, we had to write down on a piece of paper what we were doing. And it was very revealing practice to do that. And so we all did that. And then we cataloged how much time we gave to this and how much to that and so that we could kind of get a feeling for how our, our life was going. The next week, he said, okay, we're going to do that again this next week. You can open it up a little to 15 minutes instead of 10 minutes. But in the course of this next week, I want you to spend one hour in which you do nothing but think. Nothing but think. Now, this was a bit of a shock to consider because if you look back at the preceding week uh, schedule, there was no time in there that was marked, I was thinking during this period of time. Not one. None. Zilch. And I expect if you had put the time clock on yourself last week, you would have had a similar situation. That not a lot of time was given to simple, pure thought. Okay, the following week... We did this. He said, think about your job. Think about your life. Think, I don't care what you think about. 
But you're not allowed to do anything during that period of time except think. And I don't think many of us really realize how hard that was. Now, I would never, if, I, if you were to say, how much time did you spend thinking last week? Well, really, you spent most of your waking hours thinking as far as thinking is concerned. You know, you, you can't function without thinking. But what he was talking about was the cessation of all the surrounding outputs, or inputs and outputs, and so that nothing was going on in your life at that moment of time except the thought process. Now, I, I, we call this, this thing, meditation. And you want to look for it in the Bible, that's the term you would probably look for. And it's a lost art. It's a lost art for a lot of reasons. One is because of the incredible clamor of things in our society for our attention. I really think that probably one of the most damaging, it's been a, it's been a marvelous you know, and creative thing in our lives, but one of the most damaging inventions of the modern world was television. Because it brought instant entertainment into our homes all the time, along with news and a lot of valuable information and services and the extremely valuable things that television brings. But it also brings entertainment. And as a result of this, you know, we don't take the time to think. That a lot of times when we are tired, you know, and frustrated at the end of the day, instead of maybe taking a cold drink and sitting in a chair somewhere and putting our feet up on a footstool and staring off into space, we flip the television set on. Right? And we sit there and we allow television to ease our mind out of the tensions of the day. And as a consequence, there is no time in which your mind is disengaged so that it can really function at certain levels, I think, that probably God designed us to, to function. Men are still learning a lot about the mind of man. Now, I was meditating, but all of my meditation was tightly focused on, you know, before this happened, on, on sermons and program preparation and writing a letter or writing an, an article. So I was, I was meditating, and I have found many times, much to my surprise, that whenever I sit down to write, you know, write out my notes for the radio program, at the things that flow readily in and, and right on out for the preparation of the program. And sometimes it it's very quick. Sometimes it takes a little longer because it was, you know, uh, a little more complicated. But what was happening to me when I drove my car was that driving was allowing for free, free floating meditation. You know, all it was involving you know, was, was just my, uh, my driving skills, which I could relegate into one area and compartmentalize. And then the rest of my mind was free just absolutely free, liberated for free-floating thought. Now, I think that this is far more important than we realize. Uh, and I don't know, I'm not a psychologist, and I really don't want to uh, uh, imply that I am. And I'm only talking in many terms about my experiences and a few things that I have picked up from time to time from psychologists and what have you. But as human beings, we operate in several different modes, and there are some really, really startling uh, analogies that can be drawn between the human mind and the computer, which I think are fascinating, but I don't necessarily want to use those all together as, as, as what I'm trying to tell you. But when you listen to a sermon, you are in input mode, as it were. When I give a sermon, I am in output mode, okay? I'm involved in output right now, you are involved in input, receiving information. Now, you are also, while you're listening to me, processing the things that I'm talking about. It's very, it, depending upon your, the way your brain is wired, some of you will really need to listen more than once to what is said in one of these things before you will pick it up. The reason is very simple. It isn't necessarily that you're just not interested in what's being said. In fact, sometimes the fact that you are very interested in what's being said causes you not to hear things you otherwise would hear. In other words, I'm speaking along and I make a statement. I lay a line out there that you think is very important, a memorable thought. And all of a sudden, that triggers a line of thought in your mind that you follow. And then you come back to the sermon maybe five minutes later, maybe ten minutes later. I don't know. It depends on how your mind works. And you pick up the thread and go along with it. This is why people will, will come up and tell me they, they think the cassette tape is such a wonderful invention. is because they can listen to the tape several times, and they're always marveling. I get so much more out of it the second and third time. Well, the reason is very simple. You didn't hear it the first time. And the reason you didn't hear it was because, and I give you credit for this, you were thinking about what you heard, and I congratulate anyone who does that. There are, it seems to be rather rare sometimes in the world at large that people really do think about the things that they hear. Now, I, I, I think also that you can, you can do something with this, I think, that's interesting. You should be able to tell in listening to a speaker like myself or any of us who have been here or anybody you're listening to on tape whether or not the person you're listening to 
has been giving a lot of time to thinking. Some preachers that I have heard, I am convinced, have not had an original thought in 30 years. Now, the reason I say that is because I can come back to them and listen to them on tape speaking today, and I used to not heard them years ago, and I am hearing the same analogies, I am hearing the same explanations, I am hearing the same illustrations, I am hearing the same jokes, and there are people who are polite enough to chuckle at them. Uh, I'm hearing so much of the same. We, we jokingly refer to this as playing the old tapes. And uh, it's not exactly a tape because our brain is far more advanced than tape. We store this stuff digitally. And so preachers then will preach oftentimes the same sermon over and over again. Uh, John Robinson, who is the editor of, the, of In Transition, which has now gone the way where all good newspapers go, uh, he, uh, he made a statement once. He said, most ministers, he said, have four or a maximum of five sermons. And they deliver the same five sermons over and over and over again. Now, what's interesting about that is that the reason why you don't always tumble to it is because you didn't hear it the first time. You know, you weren't listening or you weren't paying attention or you didn't really realize what he'd said. But the careful, careful listener, the careful analyst will say, yeah, what he has done here, he's changed the order of the Scriptures, He's moved this story from this sermon over to this sermon. He's adapted this idea from this one over here back into this one. But a careful study will do this. And it's rather interesting if you ever sit down listening to speakers and you have a lot of their tapes and you're going to catalog them and you start trying to catalog the tapes, that's when you begin to realize what's going on. That the topics and the subjects get repeated over and over and over again. Now, the only way that I know of in which that pattern can be broken is sooner or later... A man has got to think. And when I say think, I mean he has got to have somewhere in his life the time for the free-floating thinking that goes on. Now, the mind seems to require input and output and processing time. And our processing seems to go on at more than one level. We do a lot of information processing at the conscious level. We think it through. A lot of information processing goes on at the subconscious level while we're awake. And we store all this stuff that comes in, and we put it in different places in our mind, and sometimes we can never find it again. That's what you, some of you have trouble with. Uh, even though you've got it, you heard it, you put it somewhere, and you don't know where you put it. All this stuff goes in, and we, we, we process some of it at the conscious level, some of it at the unconscious level while we're awake. And a surprising amount of work goes on when you are asleep in the processing of information. I went to a seminar years ago, or a, a workshop, where a psychologist uh, gave a presentation in which he likened the mind to a closet that is never cleaned out. And he made a statement which I thought was startling at the time, but the more I thought about it, the more I, I, I could understand what he said. He said, everything that goes into your mind stays there forever. It never leaves. It is like a closet never cleaned out. So that what goes on at the subconscious level, and what goes on when you're asleep a lot of times, is the, the sorting analyzing, connecting, trying to make connections where connections won't work uh, in, in your subconscious mind so that you have, have got something in, form, in the form of data in there that you can work with. Now, a lot of people will tell you that the intuitive feelings that we often have are not just hunches. They are the experience and the wisdom that has gotten buried away in the back of our minds that we have not necessarily consciously accessed but that we do subconsciously access. And the reason we don't feel right about something is because our experience, our knowledge, uh, all the things that we've been through, the revelation we may have even from the Bible, all these things work together to give us a feeling, for want of a better term, that this is not right. And if you ask the person to articulate why it's not right, they could not tell you. They just say, I don't feel good about it. And they tell us that you're really, in most cases, fairly wise to listen to those intuitions because they are the, the hidden wisdom of your own mind that you have accumulated over time. They can lead you astray. I have no, abs no doubt whatsoever that that could be true. But I really think that, that, that that's important. An incredible amount of processing goes on in the subconscious mind. And for many of us, I'm afraid, and, and I'm afraid I, I can say for myself at certain times in my life, that's really where almost all the creative activity has taken place. It has all gone on in the subconscious and never has really quite made it back to the conscious mind. And what I began to realize in my own case, again, I can't speak for everybody, that what meditation does is to allow that creativity to move into the conscious mind. 
that I have found that if I can stop the inputs and the outputs, or if I can package them up in one corner while I'm driving a car so that I don't have to do anything else with them, and allow my mind to run, I can do some directing of my thoughts, which all of us do from time to time, and you can make choices when you are in meditation as to which direction you want your thoughts to go. And I think oftentimes what meditation is is directed thinking. But at that time when you are relaxed, when your mind is free, when your mind can roam, you can begin to allow things to come into the conscious mind that you have stored away many, long, many years ago sometimes, and they come to light in new ways. You know, we do create knowledge for ourselves or information. We can actually synthesize knowledge. If, for example, we have a group of people over here that, that all of you know, because you have got it by empirical investigation result, that A equals B, and you know that. This group over here, by empirical research, experience, or whatever, are absolutely certain that B is equal to C, and they know that. They don't know what you know, and you don't know what they know. But I know what you know, and I know what they know. I know that A equals B. I know that B equals C. Therefore, I can make a simple synthesis and say, therefore, A equals C. I know that. You don't know it, and they don't know it. But I have both pieces of information which allows me access to a third. Now, that's a terribly, terribly simple illustration of an extremely complicated process by which you and I oftentimes arrive at conclusions which are pretty good conclusions because they are based upon the synthesis of things that we know to be true. And if both of these things are true, then a third thing must also be true. And we do this fairly naturally. Maybe people have studied it. People have analyzed it. People have tried to teach it. And uh, it can be taught at certain levels in college, university, there's, you know, logic and, and reasoning of this sort is taught. But it's a valuable thing. But the truth is that it also takes place without being taught. It is something, I think, that is, is important to all of us so, and, and, and in that, that sense. Uh, in the Old Testament, we find the word meditation primarily in the Psalms. Uh, I, I suppose we would find the idea of, of meditation, in fact, I'm quite sure we do, in other places. Uh, the problem we have sometimes is with Hebrew and with the words and, and so forth that people use, and so we don't always have a good feeling for, for it. But primarily in the Psalms, uh, we, we find this idea of meditation or thought as it is. I thought one of the things I thought was interesting about this is that the Hebrew expression that is oftentimes uh, uh, translated as meditation uh, is the murmuring of the heart. For one thing, you know, you can mutter with your lips, you can talk with your lips, but there is a murmuring of the heart. It's quiet voices. It's the, the inner man speaking, as it were, and sometimes speaking to ourselves and sometimes speaking to God, which actually constitutes meditation. Now, I want to take you uh, for just a little bit today to the 119th Psalm, which is one of the core places where this subject is discussed. My objective in this sermon today is to encourage you to make meditation a part of your life. And the reason, I mean, the only way in which you are going to make this happen is by the, you know, and maybe, maybe in fact, to use the model that uh, Mr. Lineker gave you this morning, be helpful to you, but, but you are going to have to schedule in your life a place. You're going to have to carve it out. You cannot just think, hope that someday it will take place. You're going to have, have, actually have to make it happen. To schedule in your life some time for meditation, a time when you do not allow yourself to do anything but think. You can take a pencil with you to meditation, but you should only use the temp pencil to just tap on the edge of the table, not to write. Because what is really extremely valuable is that you don't do inputs and you don't do outputs in your time of meditation. All you do is think. All right? If you can do that, if you can schedule that time, I want to just now make a couple of points for you, do something for you to think about. In Psalm 119 and verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to your word. Now, there are a lot of bad habits in our life, a lot of things that we would like to be rid of, and I think what I love about the psalmist is what a young man wants to clean up his life, wants to get his act together, wants to clean himself up. How does he do it? Well, he does it by starting to take heed to his life in conjunction with your word. In other words, a matching up of these things. Now, my question is this. How are you going to do this unless you have had the input, you have actually taken in God's Word in the first place, and then taken the time to pay a little attention to your life, 
To me, the taking heed to yourself and to your ways in your life requires thought. Deliberate, premeditated, intentional thought, right? And I sit down and I think about my life in the light of God's Word. Listen as he continues. With my whole heart have I sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, there's something that's a lost art very much in our society today, and I'm really, in many ways, I regret it. I think that all of you should give serious thought to this, though, regarding children. We have really lost the skills, it seems, in the modern world of memorization. Prior to the invention of printing, memorizing a biblical text, the memorizing of literature and so forth was very much a part of everybody's life. You know, I was thinking about this the other day, and I realized, I think I will have to learn to memorize all over again. I'm not sure I still know how. I had to in high school. I had to memorize Mark Anthony's speech. You know, I had to be able to recite Mark Anthony's speech for an English literature class in, in high school. And I'm trying to think of the last thing I had to memorize so that I could get it absolutely correct when it came back. And I was so struck not long ago, I mean, some time ago, I read an article about the survival of the Lutheran Church, and I believe it was in the Soviet Union, or it may have been the Polish Lutheran Church, but I think it was the Soviet, in the Soviet Union, that whenever there was a deliberate effort by the Soviet Union to stamp out Christianity and to stamp out the Lutheran Church, they arrested all their pastors. They, they, either, had, they either killed them or they carried them off to work camps off in the east. And then, they, and then they took their men away from them, left nothing but the Lutheran women and children behind. And they took away their Bibles. And the story was really fascinating because what the, the Lutheran women, because of their memorized scriptures, got together and, because, and, and took the scriptures that they had memorized and wrote them down again and preserved the Bible out of their own memory. They taught their children the Bible. They taught their children to memorize the scriptures. And those women preserved the Lutheran faith through that whole time so that whenever the Soviet Union began to, became unstuck and it became able to be Christian and to be openly Christian again in the Soviet Union, the Lutheran church was still there. And it survived. And the memorization of scriptures was a very important part of what they did. Well, this young man says, I, I have hid your word in my heart, which tells me that he spent a great deal of time in memorization of the scriptures. He then says, Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. Now we go to the second stage. And this important stage of memorization and locking it in is recitation. He memorized it, he recited it, he recited it, he recited it. And the recitation of these things is an important part of what goes on in the process of locking them into this closet that you never clean out. What it does, it establishes these things in prominent locations that you can access. Whereas so much of the stuff that's in your closet, as I said before, you don't have a clue where it is and couldn't find it if you wanted to. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in your precepts, and I will have respect unto your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. I think that is lost to us because we now rely so heavily on our Bibles. And, but because it's on the page, instead of being in your heart, you can never really go completely into that no input, no output mode and just process the stuff that is inside of you. Now, you can to a degree, but because you don't have those scriptures in your memory, you are not able to work your way through certain ideas, thoughts, and so forth as, as thoroughly as David might have done, or a Hebrew child might have done, who probably in many cases could have, could have recited many of these psalms with no difficulty, and in fact probably have sung them to a tune that they already knew. Music, by the way, is a great aid to memorization. It's one of the reasons why we can often remember hymns when we can't remember poems is because we remember the tune and it helps, it, helps us to, to bring it all back. So here is, a, here is a person who made a habit of his life, the input, the memorization of scriptures, the output, the recitation of scriptures, and then the processing of God's statutes, his judgments, his laws, in his mind, in his heart, which went on day and night when he was sleeping, when he was waking. You know, you wonder sometimes about what goes on in your mind when you sleep and some of the strangest things that, that take place and the strange relationships between people and times and places and the timelessness of it. And I visualize it almost like a, a hard disk on a computer where stuff is stored all over the place, oftentimes with no, connection, no, no connections, with no idea of how it relates to anything else. 
And then what you're seeing almost in your, in your mind's eye as you dream and you sleep is the cursor, not, or the, the, the little search item, running across that, that memory, picking off things and looking inside cupboards and so forth in your mind, taking note of what is there and where it is, and whether it's important to you or not, whether it's not important to you or not, and it begins to weigh all that stuff and make connections. And really, I think sometimes probably buries away things that it knows you don't want coming back up very often. All that goes on while we're asleep. You think there's nothing happening, and your brain is doing some of the most important work of the day. Well, the guy who has memorized scriptures, put them away in his mind, and spent a lot of time thinking about them, has given his brain something else to work with while he's asleep that maybe it otherwise might not have. And as a consequence of that, when he faces decisions the following day, the following week, the next year, the next month, he will have material to work with because the Bible, I mean, his brain will have taken the scriptures, which he has told his mind is very important. And his mind will take those scriptures and it will create relationships between the scriptures that he knows that are very important and certain events in his life that aren't very important and will begin to sort out why he should give attention to some things and not to others. And then comes the very important time when he chills out, takes his time, goes off and finds a rock somewhere on a hillside, stares into space, and allows to come back into his mind those things which the subconscious has been working on all along. Now, I also believe that what happens at that time is that these are the times when God is able to speak to us. I don't think we hear his voice. I don't think that God necessarily speaks that way to us. And I think that we should treat very carefully the impressions and the ideas that come into our mind. I think to be to say, well, I think God put that idea in my mind may be a little bit... You have to be careful about that. That has to be tested. Because, in fact, so many things are going to come rolling into your mind, many of which are indirectly from God. The reason they are, have come to your mind from God is because the Scripture went into your mind. Your mind processed the Scripture, and when the time was necessary, the, the Scripture worked with your, your experiences, your other knowledge, and presented you with a solution to a problem that you had been facing all along. the Spirit of God do that? Perhaps. If the Holy Spirit is a part of that process in your mind and your heart. It's something over which you have very little control. But you know, you do have a lot of control over the inputs to your mind. You have a lot of control over that. And you can make decisions to put things in there that otherwise will not be there. You can make decisions to not allow things in there that ought not to be there. And I think we need to be doing more of that than we're doing with some of the television stuff and movies that are out there nowadays. You can make decisions about all kinds of those things. But you know, the rest of it, the actual processing of it, is something you can't do much with until you have the quiet time. If you don't have a quiet time in your life when you can consciously address the things that have been going on in your mind, your subconscious, whatever you want to call that part of your mind that you're, that's processing information that you're not above, if you don't have the time to sit down and consciously allow it to come to mind, you just will not take the final steps in the organization of your thoughts, the ordering of your mind, and give yourself the opportunity for the truly creative part of your life. You're just not going to know God either as well as you can if you can allow that type of thing to take place. Now, there are so many things that time would never permit me. I'm just going to give you a couple more things out of the 119th Psalm to think about in this regard. The uh, 119th Psalm, verse 22 he said, Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Princes did sit and speak against me, but I meditated in your statutes. The fact that somebody doesn't like what I'm doing or disapproves of me is one thing, but I'm still thinking about your, your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight and my counselors. Now, one thing that's sometimes forgotten is that the Ark of the Covenant was originally called the Ark of the Testament. And the te or actually, the Ark of the Testimony. And the testimony of God was the Ten Commandments that were written down. So in the, Bible, the Old Testament speaks of your testimony. They are really talking about the law of God, the testimony of God to man about the difference between right and wrong. And he says, that testimony is what I keep thinking about, even though princes are speaking against me, even though a lot of pressure is coming upon me from high places. In the 45th verse, he says, I will walk at liberty because I seek your precepts. I will speak of your testimony before kings, and I won't be ashamed of them. I will delight myself in your commandments, which I have loved. My hands also will I lift up to your commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in your statutes. 
But you see, you've got to put them in there, folks. You really have got to put them in there, and then you have got to block out the time to think about them. I love the law of God myself. I think it is an absolutely fascinating study because I keep running into things in it that, that, that make no sense to me from where I am. Now, why, you know, why should I love something that doesn't make any sense to me? Well, because what it's telling me is there's something here you don't understand, and that's incredibly valuable. It's incredibly valuable to know that you don't understand something. Because if you don't understand it, you've got a chance of going out there and doing something about it. So the law of God, and I come to things that I don't understand, I can't figure out how to apply them, I spend more time on those things. I think about them a great deal. I put them in my heart and my mind, because although I don't understand today what they might mean, that doesn't mean I'm not going to understand them tomorrow, or a year from now, or a year beyond that. Because there's enormous value in that law and in those testimonies. Verse 145. Verse 145. It's a long psalm. I cried with my whole heart. Hear me, O Lord, and I will keep your statutes. I cried to you, save me, and I, I, I shall keep your testimony. I stopped the morning. I didn't want to see daylight. And I cried and I hoped in your word. My eyes, my eyes keep the night watches that I might meditate, meditate in your word. You know, this is a guy who, when the time came for duty, asked for the midwatch. That's a nasty watch, folks. That's the one that goes from midnight until four in the morning. The midnight to four in the morning is the one we all hated because you just barely get to sleep and they get you back up again. You just barely get back to sleep after getting off watch if you can and they get you up again at Reveille. So you have a wretched night on the midwatch. He says, I asked for it. Why do I ask for the midwatch? Because no one will bother me there and I can think. I can remember hours wandering around in the middle of the night on North Island, the Naval, Naval Air Station in North Island, with an unloaded rifle on my shoulder and no ammunition, watching to be sure that this building wasn't invaded in which there was nothing that anybody would want. <laughs> it was my job. And when you're on mid-watch, you can't, you can't read. You sure can't sleep. Uh, if they catch you sleeping, you are in a lot, of, a lot more trouble than you'll ever want to be in. It's not worth it. So you walk, and you look, and you think. He chose the midwatch because it was a time when he could be utterly alone. And the truth is, there is something about the late night quiet that is very, very conducive to thought. I've always found it so. And sometimes we use it well, and sometimes... We don't. And sometimes when we can't sleep and our mind is running fa faster and we can't settle down in any way, sometimes I think we would be better off getting up and going down and getting ourselves something warm to drink, maybe sitting in a chair somewhere, propping our feet up and staring against the wall on the other side and just allowing ourselves to think for a while and to be alone. And then go back to bed when you feel like going back to bed. Because, you know, to lie there and to thrash and to turn and to thrash and to turn... Maybe our mind is trying to tell us something. Maybe our mind are, is, is struggling to get forward with things that we need to understand, that we need to deal with, and that we haven't dealt with at this particular point in time. And we need to give it a chance to work. The last of this, of this, of this section I want to go is backward a little bit in Psalm, 97, I'm sorry, Psalm 119 and verse 97. He said, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, have made me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. Now, he did not have more understanding than his teachers because he had the commandments of God. He had more understanding than his teachers because he thought about the commandments of God. And that's different, isn't it? That's very different. He processed those things in his mind on a continual basis. Now, I was thinking about this as I, as I was getting ready for this today, and I thought the psalmist spent enormous amount of time meditating on the law of God, and he seems to say nothing about grace. And, you know, we think a lot, and we, we look at the legalistic religious societies, like the Pharisees and uh, the old worldwide church of God, and, you know, which, which have a strong legalistic approach and who really do not seem to understand the grace of God. And we oftentimes then will react against that. You know, and we'll be over here, you know, and you've got the law over there, and you've got grace over here, and this idea in people's minds. And I asked myself as I read that, 
You know, as a Christian, I not only want to meditate on God's law, I really want to meditate on God's grace. Very much so. And it occurred to me, like a bolt of lightning from the sky, the man that wrote the 119th Psalm saw the law of God as an act of the grace of God, as a manifestation of God's grace. Think about that. He saw the law as a manifestation of the grace of God. The law as a manifestation of the grace of God. Now, if you can make that little expression a part of your thought process, put that in your closet, bring it out every once in a while and look at it, I think you may begin to understand something that has not been very well understood in our tradition at all. And that is the relationship of the law and the life of the Christian. And the reason why so many of us have this incredible dread, you know, that we carry around with us all the time, that if we're going, if we make a mistake in some aspect of the law, God is going to hit us with a stuffed club and we're going to be on the ground in a whole lot of trouble with God. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. That's not what it's all about. The law is a manifestation of the grace of God that we who need to know where the stumbling blocks are in life. We need to know where the pitfalls are in life. We need, because we're wandering around the dark at night, we need something to light up the path for us so we know where it is. We need something to shed light up so we don't bang our head on something we're walking under. We need the law of God. It's gracious of God to reveal this to us. And the law is a revelation of things that will save our life. And yet we have this animosity sometimes toward the law. And we have it because of the legalism that has been so much a part of our religious heritage, which hopefully... We're beginning to work our way through and come out the other side and have a way of realizing that the law of God is perfect, it's right, it's just, it's true, and it's as true today as it ever has been at any time in the past. It's just that we understand now what it's for. It's not there to get us. It's graciously given to us to help us. And because we, in our stupidity and our foolishness and our wrongheadedness and our contrary spirit, we break that law and we get ourselves hurt. Salvation through Jesus Christ is God's way of rescuing us from the harm and the hurt that we've managed to get ourselves into. This is a small, very small concept that I'm presenting to you today. One that you should think and schedule time for think so you will have for thinking so you will have time to process the law of God, the teachings of God, the teachings of Christ, and at the same time to come to realize that the giving of the law, along with every other part of your Bible, is in itself a manifestation of the grace of God. And that you can appreciate it and be grateful for that that he has given you.